Welcome to the TaxCast from the Tax Justice Network. I'm Naomi Fowler. Coming up, what does Brexit mean for tax justice? And this... In a way, we lived in a spy story. We didn't really talk on the phone. We always, when we talked in private, we took our phones in the refrigerator uh, just to be sure that no one is listening. You get a little paranoid. I talked to the two journalists who got the Panama Papers scoop, Frederick and Bastian Obermeyer. First, here's a very quick roundup of this month's headlines. The European Union Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker has some explaining to do. He always denied any role in marketing his country of Luxembourg as a tax haven when he was Prime Minister, but documents have emerged in a court case involving Amazon versus US tax authorities, the IRS. They show he met with four senior Amazon tax officials while he was Prime Minister. Some questions to answer there. The European Union's past efforts at creating tax haven blacklists have provided good comedy material for our blogs. And now it's the OECD's turn. Check out our blog on how to get off the blacklist in baby steps on www.taxjustice.net. US Treasury Secretary Jack Lew seems to be confusing his job title with lobbyist for Apple. This month he's been in Europe trying to persuade EU officials not to stop an outrageous tax deal of around one percent Apple gets by shifting billions of dollars in worldwide revenues to Ireland. And he's asking them, please don't make them pay back taxes. Uh, No, Jack, you're supposed to be serving the public. Last month, we reported that France is the first country to commit to a public register of companies, foundations and trusts. Vive la France! Well, now there's a pushback. A US citizen and trust beneficiary is challenging the public nature of the register in the courts. We'll keep an eye on that one. And finally, French citizens discovered this month that they're paying €10,000 a month for President Hollande's hairdressing bill. (laughs) Yes, really. And politicians wonder why people get fed up with them. Those are the news headlines. Now we're going to talk to John Christensen of the Tax Justice Network for his take on this month. OK, John, so the British people have voted to leave the European Union after... I must say, some of the worst, most dishonest political campaigning I think I've ever seen in Britain. In some ways, maybe whatever the referendum question was, a lot of people were going to vote the opposite of whatever the mainstream politicians wanted them to vote for. And uh, there's been a long history of neglect and contempt, really, from successive governments towards people, and especially poor people. So we've had no investment in real productive industries, jobs, affordable housing, no positive economic vision whatsoever, and really no interest in what happens outside London. And of course, their obsessive focus on the finance sector is key to all this, isn't it? Of course, the Leave campaign got a lot of money from hedge funds and from the city, So what does this vote mean for tax justice? Well, you know, the Brexit vote has caused a huge confusion in Britain and across the rest of the world. Normally, when you're going to make a huge constitutional change of such magnitude, you'd require something like a two-thirds majority. But in fact, the majority was wafer thin. No one really knows what it means and what will be the outcome once negotiations have been completed several years, possibly even a decade down the line. Now, the City of London shares this confusion. The hedge fund managers, they love this vote because a Brexit creates confusion and uncertainty that will provide them with the opportunities they love for speculative trading. The big investment banks in London, however, are very worried because this uncertainty about access to the European Union's single market will potentially lead to trading activities migrating to Frankfurt and to Paris. And that's because when you operate outside the single market, you lose the banking licence, the so-called banking passport, to trade within what is, let's face it, the world's single biggest financial services market. Now, if the London banks lose the passport to trade within the single market, then their options become significantly reduced. The supporters of Brexit are trying to talk things up. They're very optimistic about building market share elsewhere in the world. But that's not going to be so easy. As we saw earlier this year, big UK banks like Barclays have actually had to sell off their African operations because they weren't sufficiently profitable. So what are the alternatives? 
Well, all the signs point to London wanting to stake out an even bigger market share in the offshore financial secrecy market. It already has the world's largest overall share of offshore financial services, and its tax haven satellites in the Cayman, the Channel Islands and so on, remain highly secretive. So it does seem to me, to be quite clear, there is a very real possibility that as they lose market share in normal, plain vanilla banking services, they are more likely to head off down the tax haven route. And Brexit seems to have breathed new life into this so-called F4 alliance, quite an unholy alliance between Switzerland, Singapore, Hong Kong and Britain's financial centres. The Swiss Bankers Association is renewing its efforts to resurrect their previous attempt to form this alliance, to lobby as a block for access to EU markets and to, in their words, coordinate worldwide in areas such as regulation and market access. Huge global secrecy players, players ranked in the top four by the Tax Justice Network's Financial Secrecy Index. Top four if you combine all the UK's satellite havens. Uh, which, of course, makes them number one. (laughs) This is a very sinister uh, development. Now, between them, these F4 offshore financial centres control about 37% of the global market for offshore financial services. So this is potentially a really powerful political lobby with a huge investment in offshore financial secrecy. A very threatening alliance since they could potentially reverse attempts to push forward with many of the financial transparency measures that G8 and G20 have been attempting in the last five years. Now, for years, Swiss banks have been trying to negotiate access to the entire European single market for offshore financial services. And indeed, they already have bilateral treaties enabling the market access to quite a few European countries, but not to the entire single market. And the reason for that is because they've been blocked, because the European Union, in return for access to the single market, requires complete freedom of movement of labour, that is European labour, into the Switzerland. And that's something the Swiss government is unwilling to concede. Presumably their thinking now is that the combined pressure of the United Kingdom and Switzerland will overcome that hurdle because of the huge size of the Swiss and London capital markets in combination. And they think that they might be able to persuade the European Union to make that concession on providing access to the single market without requiring freedom of movement of labour. Now, I think we need to keep a very watchful eye on this F4 proposal because the toxic nature of the offshore secrecy provided by Singapore, Hong Kong, Switzerland and the United Kingdom and its tax havens will be really contagious right the way across the financial markets. And in many respects, this signal from the F4, as far as work concerns, represents the four horsemen of the apocalypse beginning to regroup and create a new, very powerful financial services lobby to roll back on the transparency measures we've seen some progress on. That's a pretty grave warning. And uh, I should say as well, in terms of agreements that have been made between OECD members and G7, G20, you know, in terms of the European Union, it's not exactly been a beacon of light in terms of uh, what they could have achieved with transparency. But there are a number of things which Britain has signed up for that it might not otherwise have done, which it might backtrack on as well. It's a concern too, isn't it? I think this is a huge concern. Let's not pretend the European Union has got things right. It hasn't got things right in so many different areas, not least, you know, the recent Luxembourg leaks has revealed the market distortions within the single market because of these special tax deals done by Luxembourg and PricewaterhouseCoopers. But at least in the last 20 years, Europe has attempted to take the lead in areas such as automatic information exchange, creating a single framework for taxing multinational companies, the so-called common consolidated corporate tax base. Europe has also made quite a lot of progress towards country-by-country reporting. There is a real danger that once Britain is without Europe, it will roll back on all of these things, and it certainly is unlikely to force them upon its tax haven satellites, the Channel Islands and the Caymans and so on. I think that Britain's likely development strategy will be to actually deepen its tax haven role sitting offshore Europe. 
Right. And another effect after the Brexit vote was this uh, accelerated race to the bottom, which the Tax Justice Network has warned about for such a long time. The then Chancellor George Osborne, who's now lost his job, goodbye George, he has announced proposals for a corporate tax cut from 18%, which it is at the moment, to, in his words, less than 15%. First of all, there's no evidence whatsoever that this helps economic growth or encourages investment. But why might they stop at 15%? I mean, if we take a look at Ireland, Ireland's rate is 12.5%, although Apple famously paid somewhat less than that. I think it was uh, about 2%. (laughs) And Jersey went all the way to 0% and subsequently went bust. (laughs) Yep. And I think that's This is where the UK government wants to head. Even within the Cameron government, there was a very strong pressure for complete abolition of the corporate income tax. And I think that the composition of the current government suggests that they will go down a similar route. The increased pressure from within the UK, um, from the banking world and so on, the corporate world, to focus on this global race to the bottom is very disturbing. More worrying still is that the influential Sunday Times newspaper in Britain has signalled that a 10% corporate income tax rate should be the target rate for boosting the flagging UK economy. The only people who will benefit from the tax race to the bottom are the very rich. And if the government persists with this route, it will only make inequality in Britain even worse and will undermine attempts by European Union governments to maintain a reasonable corporate income tax rate and keep the corporate income tax as a viable tax. This is a massively retrograde step. Interestingly, uh, the Bank of England Governor Mark Carney said a couple of years ago it would be okay by him to have UK bank balance sheets at 900% of GDP if that's the way they wanted to go. And (laughs) that's obviously not a good idea. (laughs) No, it clearly isn't a good idea. And perhaps Mark Carney needs to read up on the finance curse and how Britain has become probably the, the, the biggest single example within the global economy of a political economy that has been captured by the finance curse. Massive over-dependence upon a financial services market that essentially sits offshore the real UK economy and serves no useful wealth creation purpose within the UK economy. And I think that is the biggest structural problem the UK faces. Thanks, John. John Christensen of the Tax Justice Network. Now it's time for the TaxCast special feature. The Panama Papers scandal took the world by storm and exposed how the very rich hide their wealth offshore. This massive leak of internal data from the Panamanian-based law firm Mossack Fonseca is the biggest ever. 400 journalists from more than 80 countries got involved in investigations. This month, the TaxCast talks to the two journalists who got the scoop, Bastian Obermeyer and Frederick Obermeyer. They're not related, by the way, they just happen to have the same surnames. It all started about a year ago, as Bastian explains. This message arrived and it was very plain. It was, uh, hi, this is John Doe. Are you interested in data? We're very interested. Of course, he wrote back. After agreeing they'd never meet in person, encrypted conversations between the Obermeyers and their anonymous source, who called himself John Doe, began. I may not know the name or the identity of this person, but I have the feeling to know the person, you know, in a way. Because if you talk to somebody for more than a year, and on many days more than to your wife and to your friends, then you get a feeling for this person, and I'm completely sure that he or she felt a moral obligation to leak the files because he or she saw what's going inside Mossack Fonseca and so he or she had to do this. Frederick Obermeyer. In former investigations we have already seen companies of Mossack Fonseca being involved in some of our investigations but we were not able to find out who the beneficial owner of these companies are. And now having their source offering material from exactly that Panamanian law firm made this thrilling for me at the first glance. And then when we, when I saw the first documents, when we did the first cross checks, and when we saw that this material is authentic, then it was like, wow, this is a huge treasure trove because it will give us a unique insight into the offshore world and one of the major players there. 
Do you feel worried for this person still, for their safety? Yes, of course, because what John Doe did was a huge duty for society. The material of John Doe revealed so many shady things going on in the offshore world that there are so many people now that may have a reason to be angry at John Doe and seeing that there are arms dealers, mafiosi, the best friend of Vladimir Putin, members of drug cartels in the data. I mean, these are people you don't or you shouldn't mess with. So I think it was a good decision of John Doe to stay anonymous, not only to the public, but also to Bastion and me, because you now could even put a pistol on our head, but we wouldn't be able to reveal the identity because we still don't know it. And I think that's the best protection John Doe could provide to himself. So as John Doe sent you more and more data, you kept having to ask your bosses at your newspaper, Süddeutsche Zeitung, to pay for bigger and bigger specialised computers in order to be able to handle and search it all properly. And the computer you ended up with cost €17,000. So imagine you know a lot more about computers now than you ever did before. Yes, yes, indeed. I mean, we haven't been nerds before, um, as we may be now. We uh, we had to index files and we had to make it text recognizable with an OCR system. We had all these passwords, which were longer than all my names together. And it's really hard to, to learn all this, you know, to make no mistakes when you're dealing with your source. So I think I never had a year where I learned such a lot of things. What I found really interesting was that in the data John Doe was sending you, you were sometimes getting Mossack Fonseca emails in real time. Yes, I mean, we received emails being like from some days before. And that was thrilling because that showed us that we could really look like standing behind one of the Mossack Fonseca guys working there. And then seeing and reading all these revealing emails that really showed me that they are acting really cold-blooded. For example, if we take an email conversation between some um, partners of Mossack Fonseca speaking about Rami Makhlouf, the cousin of Bashar al-Assad, a person that at that time was already sanctioned by the EU and the US, and at a time when the Syrian war already started. Rami Makhlouf is known to be a financier of the Syrian regime, and they kept him as a customer. And then reading their conversation on, well, um, shouldn't there be a, a red flag? And they decided, well, no, we keep him as a customer because HSBC allegedly at that time had no problem with him. And that showed me how cold-blooded they are because a person that is sanctioned, that should already be a red flag. But then knowing that this person is sanctioned because it's, it's said to be financing the Syrian regime and thus the Syrian war. This should be a much bigger red flag. And going on with such a person, keeping him as a customer, shows me that they didn't give a shit, sorry for the word, but but for a war going on in Syria, a war that cost hundreds of thousands of lives and is the reason for the huge refugee crisis we uh, at the moment uh, are facing here in Europe. A question many people have asked is why you didn't put this data onto some kind of WikiLeaks-style open data online directory so anybody could jump in and try to mine the data for themselves. Yes, and I, I do understand that question because I do understand the need for more transparency in this field of the offshore world. But what is important for us, I think that we cannot be 100% sure that there is no hint leading to John Doe in the data. And I'm pretty sure that there are some people out there who really want to track down uh, John Doe and not tracking him down to thank him and say hello, but to doing harm to him. And that's a reason why I do not want to publish it for the public. But that's not the only reason. Due to German press law, we would not be allowed to publish this material because Due to our legislation um, here in Germany, there, there's private information in this uh, document. And we would have to blacken out not only names, but also if there's a conversation on private things going on in there. And blackening out one, 1. 1.5 million documents, and some of those documents have hundreds of pages, that would mean a lifetime task for me. And 
I think it's more important to investigate this uh, stuff, to keep the investigation going on and not me sitting there blackening out names and private information. Furthermore, John Doe handed this over to us for uh, journalistic purposes. And if he or she wants it out there in the public, uh, then he can do it. We would never stop him on uh, doing so. Right. And John Doe has offered to cooperate with law enforcement as far as he or she or they are safely able. And there's never been such a large amount of data leaked before, ever. No, it's the biggest leak until now. It's uh, 2.6 terabyte of data and more than 11.5 million documents. So it's around 10 times bigger than the offshore leaks. We've got very worthful documents, more than 5 million emails. So it's really worth a lot, yeah. I guess that we haven't looked at more than 10% of the files. What would be really interesting, if it didn't expose your source too much to risk, would be, of course, to have full criminal investigation with subpoena powers. Because as you say in the book, there are many, many more stories in that data that you haven't got to yet that are for sure prosecutions waiting to happen. Yes, that's a reason why we are still adding new partners to this project. So these investigations are still running. We are still working on dozens of leads. And speaking about authorities, I support all this stuff being officially investigated. But as we have seen in the past at projects like offshore leaks and stuff like that, we saw that authorities, even if they have such material, they do not really act fast. And I think, unfortunately... It's easy to speak out as a politician against tax heaven and demanding more investigations and demanding material from journalists. But these authorities, the same authorities, do have real big powers. They can raid offices. They can ask other countries for more information. But they do not do it. And in Germany, especially, we see a huge lack of personnel at, uh, for example, the tax authorities. If we speak with people in this field, with investigators, they always tell us, well, we would really like to do more in this field. And we have so many cases we should work on, but we do not have the capacities. So if politicians really want to change something, a first step would be putting more personnel into the tax authorities and the tax uh, investigators. And if political will was really there to tackle this, they'd start with very strong whistleblower protection laws too, wouldn't they? Well, speaking about whistleblower protection, I mean, there is actually no protection for whistleblowers, unfortunately. And if we would find a whistleblower protection that encourages these people to stand out and to hand over data and documents to the authorities, this would help all of us. This would help the society. So you and your newspaper, Süddeutsche Zeitung, understood pretty quickly this leak was way too big for you to tackle alone. And you contacted the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists in the United States. And in the book, you describe flying over there, bringing the data with you, hidden in a pretty elaborate way. It's a bit like a spy story. Yes, <laughs> yes, in a way, we lived in a spy story because, I mean, this was really a strange situation. And when we flew to the US, I mean, we had to have this encrypted hard drive, the external hard drive, which had two storages in it. And, and one was hidden and the other one was not hidden. And we got different passwords. So if somebody would have stopped us, you know, and said, you have to open this, then we would have used only the one password and nobody could have seen that there's another one on this external hard drive. We also, we didn't really talk on the phone. We always, when we talked in private, we took our phones in the refrigerator uh, just to be sure that no one is listening. You get a little paranoid if you do this for, 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 for a longer time. Not surprising at all when you see how the data revealed the lengths Mossack Fonseca was prepared to go to protect the identities of their very wealthy clients. I mean, they were doing all kinds of things like charging huge fees to transfer money through incredibly complicated routes. When, of course, as we know, banks charge very little really for simple money transfer services. 
Marcet Fonseca was sending completely blank legal documents ready signed by nominee directors of these shell companies, some of them to major banks. And incredibly, they were offering clients who wanted an extra, extra, extra layer of secrecy for a special service of nominee beneficial owners. Yes. And <laughs> I mean, the nominee beneficial owner is a service which is very forbidden, even in Panama. This is illegal in Panama. You can see when Mossack Fonseca knows that what they're doing is now very much illegal. You can see it on the price they charge you because they really charge you a lot. So to get a nominee beneficial owner, you have to pay $30,000 for the first year and then 15000 for the following year. And we have this U.S. person, Mariana Olszewski, who paid seemingly $60,000 US for two years of beneficial ownership from some guy who just pretended to be the beneficial owner of her company. So this is really absolutely and completely forbidden. It's really interesting that Mossack Fonseca knew this and still offered it. And these nominee directors or front people themselves seem to be pretty ordinary Panamanians basically being paid peanuts while pulling in these big fees, the Mossack Fonseca. One woman was a front person for 25,000 shell companies and she was earning the firm many hundreds of thousands of dollars a year at least. And they were just paying her a few thousand dollars a year salary. Mossack Fonseca was getting these front people to sign hundreds of blank documents which could be used for almost anything that might be needed for future transactions to avoid, I suppose, having to pay them to come in and sign documents. Yes, reading these documents for more than a year really showed me that unfortunately we are living in a world where there's the world people like you and me are living in. And that there's a second world, parallel world, the offshore world, where people with enough money will always find possibilities to hide their money from the tax authorities, hide their wrongdoings from criminal investigators, or hiding it, for example, from their wife. And that there are people out there choosing which law they want to stick to. And that's a problem for democracy. That is something which we should all be aware of. Of course, this goes far beyond Central America and Panama. The destination, the jurisdiction that we found by far the most in the Panama Papers was not Panama. This was the British Virgin Islands. It's a UK territory in a way, a territory where Mr. Cameron really had a lot of influence on. And still he didn't act. And we saw many intermediaries from Jersey and from Guernsey. And we see that Nevada and Wyoming and Delaware have very good possibilities for everybody who wants to hide money. So it's about the whole offshore world. And the whole offshore world is not in a shady Latin American country. It's just everywhere around us. It's in Luxembourg. It's in Ireland. So there are so many offshores. Right, and there's a long feeding chain in the financial secrecy industry linking up plenty more law firms with major banks who are enjoying a certain amount of government protection. I mean, this whole industry depends on the support of big global players like the United Kingdom, the United States and Germany. It's obvious that public registers of the real owners of anonymous financial vehicles is what's needed. I'm very thrilled what would happen if you take away the secrecy, if you take away the anonymity. I'm completely sure the whole system would crash because why would they go to the BVI, the British Virgin Islands, for a company where you can see who owns it? You know, it's not rocket science. And I think that there is no politician can deny anymore that there's something going wrong in the offshore world. And until our governments finally have the will to do something about this, in the meantime, we have whistleblowers, those brave enough to risk everything. Apparently, Swiss banks are so worried about leaks now, they've returned to using old-fashioned handwritten ledgers. Seeing all these leaks, offshore leaks, Swiss leaks, Lux leaks, Panama Papers, this must be a strong signal to the offshore world that people hiding there cannot feel safe anymore. That there could already be in this moment while we speak a person putting a USB stick to a computer and downloading compromising stuff or a a person or employee of one of those companies working in this field 
standing now at this moment in front of a copy machine and making copies. And this may lead to some change, even if it's not changed by legislation, but changed in, in this world that people there cannot feel safe anymore. Frederick and Bastian Obermeyer's book is called The Panama Papers, breaking the story of how the rich and powerful hide their money. It's unputdownable and it's published by One World. Try to buy it from a bookseller that pays their taxes. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next month. Thank you.